Hey guys, Tony here. So apologies for the poor video quality and the sound. I'm at the office today, not ready to do a recording, but I want to get this posted anyway. So if you guys have been following any of my content, you know that I post a lot of resources specific to the understanding of what's medically necessary, what's a covered service, what's not, and how we can marry uh, those services, covered services and non-covered services, to really provide the ultimate patient care experience. That, that's what I'm all about, is not being limited to what the payer will pay for, but rather giving the patient the ultimate package, what you believe as the clinician is best for the patient, and then allowing the patient to choose if they want the full package, in which case there's gonna be services the patient pays for directly and services Medicare pays for, or if they want the economy package, and the economy package being only what Medicare will cover. So in this video module, I'm gonna take a specific scenario. Now, it was brought up in our Medicare group. Somebody had asked, she was in a situation where she was treating an individual. This individual is not a Medicare beneficiary. She was treating this individual on a self-pay cash basis, the uh, individual's coverage did not pay for services. And during the course of care, this individual all of a sudden became a Medicare beneficiary. And she was under the impression, which most of us are, that she was not allowed to provide cash-based services to a Medicare beneficiary. Um, obviously, it's because of the mandatory claim submission law and if you're not contracted with Medicare as a PAR or non-PAR provider, you're unable to submit that claim for covered services. So I'm not disputing that. Uh, that's clearly stated. There, it's a very black and white scenario. But what I'm explaining in this scenario is not all services are covered services. Even services that would otherwise be covered in different scenarios may not be covered. And because this individual therapist had a history with this patient, I, I want to use this as a case scenario. And I want to show you kind of some of the resources I would go to. And at the end of the day, it's going to come down to your professional judgment. I'm not telling you that an individual should be, you know, switched to cash simply because you're not contracted. I'm telling you that you need to look at the big picture, understand the, the regulations, understand the situation of the individual provider, the individual patient, and then determine the best plan. So in this situation, let's assume um, <clears throat> we've got some of the facts straight. So from what I understand, the individual patient had been dealing with the persistent pain problem. They were receiving care over a long uh, duration, and they required the skills of a therapist. Uh, if I remember correctly, it was a pelvic floor uh, issue that they were dealing with. Okay, let's jump into the literature now and let's take a look at some published CMS guidelines and then we'll come back to this story and, and the way I would approach it from my perspective. Let's start with information on an advanced beneficiary notice. What I like about the ABN is that there's specific language uh, at different parts of the journey. And so specifically, we're looking at CMS chapter 30. We're coming down to section 50, and we're going to go down to the triggering events, 50.5. This is important because remember, this individual situation is a little unique. The, the client had been seen by the therapist for a duration prior to becoming a Medicare beneficiary. So I would say rather than looking at this from, you know, the care was not medically necessary at the onset, I've got videos on that. Let's look at a reduction. Let's look at a situation here where Medicare is saying a reduction occurs when the, there is a decrease in the component of care, frequency or duration. The ABN is not issued every time an item or service is reduced. But if the reduction occurs and the beneficiary wants to receive care that's no longer considered medically reasonable and necessary, reasonable is going to be an important component here. The ABN must be issued prior to delivery of non-covered care. And it gives you the example. I'm going to zoom in so you guys can see it a little better. Mr. T receiving outpatient therapy five days a week. After meeting several goals, therapy is reduced to three days a week. Mr. T is... Uh, 
wants to achieve a higher level of proficiency in performing goals related to the activities and wants to continue five days a week. He's willing to take the financial responsibility for the cost of the two days of therapy that are no longer medically reasonable and necessary. An ABN would be issued prior to providing the additional days of therapy. So here's the situation. Um, <clears throat> Mr. T wants to continue care. He is allowed to hire a therapist to deliver that care. The care does not require the skills of a therapist, but it can be delivered by a therapist. And, and that's the distinction here that you need to make. And that's where we now take this information, kind of keep it in your head. Let's jump over to CMS chapter 15 document. And we're going to look at a situation under rehabilitative. Now there's rehabilitative care and maintenance. I want you to understand both of those. Um, covered maintenance therapy is different than just wellness or, or non-covered maintenance therapy. So for rehabilitative therapy specifically, if an individual's expected rehab potential is insignificant in relation to the extent and duration of therapy services required to maintain such potential, rehabilitative therapy is not reasonable and necessary. That means it's not a covered service, right? And of course, it, it'll say the same thing for maintenance. Maintenance, unless it requires the skills of a therapist, um, it's not reasonable and necessary. So my first gut response to this situation is, if I've been seeing a client for two, three months, I've reached a certain level of functional gain improvement, you know, I can make certainly a case to say, well, if I stop therapy now, the client will decline. Pain alone is not an indication for covered service. A person can have lots of pain and still be fully functional. I understand pain in certain areas is perceived as worse than pain in other areas, but understand that pain alone is not an indication for therapy. So for example, I receive a referral for an individual with shoulder pain. We're gonna keep it really simple. And I, and I say to this person, were you able to dress yourself this morning? Yes, but oh man, my shoulder hurts so bad. Okay, were you able to feed yourself this morning? Were you able to drive to the clinic? Are you living independently? Are you able to manage your own you know, finances? And are you able to function and live in society and go to the, the supermarket and go to church and do the things that you need to do independently? Sorry, I'm getting a call. Um, if the answer to all of those things is yes, while pain is a problem, pain is an impairment, nobody wants to deal with it, continued care str strictly for pain relief is not a covered service. Now, it could influence how good, how well the functional activities are being performed. But at the end of the day, once I show this person what to do, even though pain persists, if they're cognitively alert and able to do it, pain is not an indication for continued therapy. Medicare, now, I'm, I'm going to reference a couple of things and I'm going to jump around on you guys some. So LCDs, for the most part, really don't exist anymore. This is from the Novitis website. This is still an active LCD. Let me see if I can find what I was looking for here. And when we come into this area, again, we've got information about rehabilitative therapy, and it, it talks about that. We've got information about maintenance therapy. Um, an interesting component here that I like in this language, and the reason why I'm showing you this is because you're going to use these sources to create your policy to support your decision making. It's not enough for you just to say, well, it wasn't medically necessary, so I charged cash. You can't do that. You have to say, based on Medicare guidelines, publication, you know, CMS chapter 15, page, whatever, uh, updated on this date, <clears throat> CMS clearly establishes the guideline. Based on that policy, this patient's care is not medically necessary, um, reasonable and necessary. But one of the things I wanted to find here, uh, so obviously, from a maintenance perspective. We saw rehabilitative from a maintenance perspective. Reha uh, sorry, services related to general good and welfare of the patients, not covered. Uh, 
repetitive exercises to maintain gait, maintain strength, endurance, uh, not covered, range of motion, passive exercises not covered, maintenance therapy after the patient has achieved goals. Remember, goals are functional goals. Your plan of care requires functional goals. If the person is performing the function, maybe not to the level and the expectation that you or the person wants, but if they're performing the activity and it's not dangerous, according to Medicare guidelines, they've met the goal. Uh, and that's a, that's a new revelation for me, new within the last few years. You know, I always would say, let me see you take off your shirt. They would do all this kind of awkward, weird stuff. And I would say, no, you should be able to take your shirt off like a hundred other people take their shirt off. But the reality is that's probably a stretch. That's probably not reasonable and necessary, certainly not necessary. Um, <clears throat> so back here, you know, patients that do not require skilled care, which I hate the term skilled care. I prefer the term skills of a therapist, um, the necessary skill level of the service provided. In here somewhere, of course, I'm on the spot now, you know, it's not medically necessary for qualified professionals to perform or supervise maintenance programs, perform or supervise maintenance programs that do not require professional skills of a qualified professional. Um, these are the guidelines, right? So my question to you, as much as you have the highest level of education, and I have the most respect for you as a clinician, I need you to take off your clinician hat for a second, and I need you to step back and say, okay, I've shown this individual over the course of weeks and months and maybe years of one-on-one of -on -one sessions, what really needs to be done? Does this person continue to require my skills as a therapist to do it? Can they safely do it with a personal trainer? Somebody who's got a master's degree in exercise physiology who I show how to do this, can they do it? Does a patient, the individual, understand what needs to be done? They might not want to do it on their own. They might need your motivation, your encouragement. You know, you might be there for a lot of other non-covered reasons. But the reality is, could they do it on their own? If I show somebody how to do something once and then they demo it a second time, maybe they take a couple cues, can they do it independently on the third time? Not will they, can they? If the answer is yes, it's no longer a covered service. And I think this is where we kind of overextend our services. Um, but if I, if I have a self-pay model available to me, this is the time to use it. Let's jump back into the um, CMS chapter 15. Let's look at, from a rehabilitative therapy perspective, what are some of the procedures that are covered? Obviously, the initial evaluation, reevaluation, covered services. Reevaluation is kind of a nuance that needs to be explained more, but not here. So, you were seeing this client before they switched to become a Medicare beneficiary. You already performed the evaluation. There's gonna be a time and a place for another you know, assessment, but the question is, you've already initiated the plan of care. Establishing goals. Absolutely, this, this requires the skills of a therapist when you're establishing goals related to a specific medical condition, pathology, you're taking into account, you know, lifestyle complexities, all the, all of these other things, um, designing the program. You did all of these things before they were a Medicare beneficiary. Continued assessment and analysis during implementation of services. This is what catches people, I think. Um, we'll come back to that in a second. Instruction leading to the establishment of compensatory skills. So not continuing to teach the skills, but teaching initially to learn the skills. Selecting devices uh, that replace or augment function. Obviously, this could be you know, any kind of medical equipment or anything like that. And then training the patient or the family to augment rehabilitative treatment. This augmented rehabilitative treatment, that's what I'm calling kind of supplemental care. Training of staff or family to should be ongoing throughout the treatment, instructions modified intermittently, intermittently as the patient's status changes. Let's take this one more level real quick. 
Um, look at this line right here. So services that can be safely and effectively furnished by non-skilled or PTA, OTA without the supervision of a therapist uh, are not rehabilitative services. So one more time, you know, if you can determine based on your professional opinion that these services can be rendered without your skill set, <clears throat> your knowledge base, they're not covered. Okay. Initially, they need you, but do they still need you? Um, and so back to this continued assessment, you know, this is where I say in an ideal world, if you really wanted to make this 100% black and white, you would team up with a contracted therapist. You would say to your, your client, look, I am not allowed to provide you with assessments. I can collect information, but at the end of the day, that's a billable service that requires a Medicare participating provider, either PAR or non-PAR, but a Medicare contracted uh, individual. So you say, I know John, John does an amaz amazing job. Every six weeks, I'm gonna send you to see John so he can kind of update the medical record and comply with Medicare guidelines. Between those six week sessions, I'm gonna be the one working with you directly carrying out the plan of care we established in the beginning. These are not covered services by Medicare because you're not a contracted uh, provider, supplier, non-physician practitioner. Uh, but the idea is that you've got this hybrid model where John, the contracted individual, can provide the covered service, which at this point, the only real covered service is gonna be continued assessment updates to the plan of care, determining if goals have been met, long-term goals and things like that. Beyond that, you're providing the services between covered services. And that's where we go back to this as a reference. Just because this is five days a week where two of the days um, are not medically necessary, you've progressed this individual to two or three days a week with you, and then once every six weeks, a follow-up assessment. Now let's jump on the maintenance side real quick, and this is, I'll, I'll wrap things up here. So under maintenance therapy, here are maintenance programs, this is CMS chapter 15. Uh, obviously the establishment or the design of a maintenance program is a covered service. Delivery of the program in certain scenarios may be covered, but let's take a look at one of their examples. This is the one that I reference all the time. So where there is an unhealed, unstable fracture that requires regular exercise to maintain function until the fracture heals, the skills of a therapist may, doesn't even say are, may be needed to ensure the fractured extremity is maintained in a proper position, alignment, during the range of motion exercises. So like, I don't think any of us are gonna disagree. You know, if, if there is an absolute requirement for something like that, Un unstable humeral fracture, we need shoulder, glenohumeral range of motion, clinician needs to do it. I'm not gonna give that to somebody else. But if somebody's just dealing with a pain issue and they're, they're able to do things independently or they're able to do things with somebody who's been educated by you, the clinician, that's not a covered service. That does not require your constant attendance throughout the entire episode. Um, I would say this, this also applies to, you know, a wound that's not healing or an individual who has an unstable medical complexity like a cardiac event. They're, they're at genuine risk for a heart attack during your treatment. They're at general, genuine risk for a stroke during your treatment. Those are medical complexities that absolutely require covered services. But I go back to the first series of questions. Are you living in the community independently? Are you feeding yourself, bathing yourself, dressing yourself? While we understand as clinicians, that's, that's barely being alive, that's not living, that's not the intent of Medicare. Medicare is in, it intent is not to make treatment enjoyable. It's not to make treatment um, feel good, it's, it's, it's about taking the person from point A to point B functionally, point B being minimal standard of living, or it's about taking a person you know, who's unsafe, high risk, 
and making sure they're receiving the services they need in a safe environment. But in, in most of our situations, outpatient, ortho, neuro, patient's been living independently, patient has support around them, patient is driving and functioning and, and managing finances, cognitive alert, you know, no significant dementia, no significant risk factors, um, just in a lot of pain, just in a lot of frustration, not living the life that they want to live, those services are not medically necessary and not covered once you've gotten past the eval, the plan of care, establishing goals, basic education, you know, the items listed here. And I think for most of you, especially somebody who's been working with somebody more than a couple sessions, you're past that point. I've got other resources. I don't want to monopolize your time. We can continue to develop this conversation because it's important, but I wanted to address this case specifically. Don't let your, your um, <clears throat> understanding of therapy and what you do be influenced by the payer's understanding of what they are paying for. While we call it physical therapy and, and Medicare says we pay for physical therapy, you have to understand their definition of physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech. It's generally different than ours, right? My definition of a car might be different for somebody who has a $10,000 budget and somebody who has a $100,000 budget. Both of them are cars, but they are extremely different cars. Physical therapy in, in a large portion of the profession is still laying on a plinth, hooking up an e-stim, doing ultrasound, um, you know, but that's a different, different definition of physical therapy compared to what you're providing. And what you're providing is different than what Medicare is paying for. I hope that that starts to open some doors for you. And, and like I said, this is untested water. I'm the first to admit it. Look at Medicare examples, look at their guidelines, tease out the information that supports your decision making, because at the end of the day, you're the professional making the decision. Guys, I hope this was helpful. I'm gonna to try to put out some more content. Um, hybrid practices, combining cash and covered services, either in a single session, across multiple sessions, at the end of care, there's lots of different ways to do this. I want you guys to feel confident and find the resources. This isn't my opinion. I'm not giving you, you know, my thought. This is what's published. I'll catch you guys on the next video. Thank you all so much for watching.